Ladies and gentlemen, here is Ronnie Corbett. Thank you very much. How very sweet. You don't think the trousers are too much, do you? <laughs> Rupert Bear's cast offs. <laughs> I actually wanted a tartan jacket as well, but Anne said it was a waste of a perfectly good handkerchief. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to be very careful. You know, my size, if I'm all tartan, I tend to look like a thermos flask. But... <laughs> How this all happens, how I happen to be here tonight, how it came to pass. Well, I'll tell you, well, Tatton's the, the producer, Paul Lewis, very, very, very important man. Uh, he's not here at the moment, he's gone down the road to get me a sandwich. But he, <laughs> he, <laughs> you may <laughs> You may have seen him actually on the way in, you know, with his clipboard and his earphones and his red dress. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> Shouldn't worry you. It, but Paul wrote me this letter. No, actually, he phoned me up. Well, he didn't really phone me. He doesn't phone. No, no, he doesn't phone people, you know. He sent round Jonathan Aiken with a set of proposals. <laughs> and, and he sent me. I can make jokes, by the way, about Paul, quite safe, because we've known each other for a number of years, you know. We went to the same school together. <laughs> he, what, what I mustn't forget, he once managed the five Nolan sisters. There you go. Now, sadly, can only manage two or three, but he did <laughs> something to <deep. But, laughs> he, he wrote me this. I know what I was going to tell you, because he wrote me this letter. And I remember the day very clearly when the letter arrived. It was the one day of the year when Allied carpets were not having a sale. <laughs> and, uh, he said... He wrote me this. And he wrote it, addressed it to me in my proper style and title. You're not Ronnie Corbett, the show. Ronald Gervais Courtney de Corbett. 14th <laughs> Earl of Muscleborough and Queen's Champion. <laughs> <laughs> the, title, the title's not been mentioned in the handout, the, you know, the court circular, but it was mentioned in the handout at Tesco's the other day when I most graciously opened the new bacon counter. <laughs> which I received a few quid and half a pig's head, <laughs> which my wife, the Lady Martians, refused to cook. So it was still smiling. And, uh, <laughs> Well, sort of half smiling. Anyway, so, <laughs> so that, that is how it all came to pass, and that is how I'm here. And we've received some rather lovely messages, which I'm sure you might like to hear. Very warming, welcoming. Mayor. Best wishes for your show tonight. If you're not the finest comedian in the country, I'm a Dutchman. <laughs> Signed Hans van Gelder of Amsterdam. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we did invite Eric Cantona, and he replied, as the salmon leaps from the river, so the fisherman's boots fill with water. <laughs> now, we're not really sure if that is a yes or a no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ian McCaskill said he'd be sweeping in from the north and arriving in the southeast by late Sunday, which is very nice. <laughs> My dear mate Dan Aru can't be here either, but he left a very kind message with a name and address. Uh, at the door. And a very nice dress it is, too. <laughs> and, uh, I've had this other one saying, best wishes for the show. Hope it's not going to contain the usual references to your diminutive stature and lack of inches. Come off it, you're no different for the rest of us. Dudley Moore in Hollywood. It's very <laughs> no, he said that because I've been, I've been working with Dudley on a, on a, on a film just recently. And... Uh, <laughs> I played the very demanding role of Dolly Parton's chiropodist. <laughs> So I was working in the dark to a large extent. <laughs> <laughs> but the real thrill for me was at the end of Picture Party because they had a little band there, a little trio, and I managed to have a dance with Dolly, which was very lovely. And uh, not only could I not see where I was going, <laughs> I couldn't hear the band. <laughs> how lovely to see you. Lovely to see you. I was wondering how you got started. How I got started? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's very nice of you to ask that question because it is a qu you know in this business one of the great things we move about we meet new friends everywhere we go you bump into people don't you people always come up and say you know 
get out of the way or I... <laughs> people always do say to me how did you what made you decide to become a comedian you know which is what I am <laughs> now, I always mention that just in case you know might be some foreigners you know who might think I'm a glove puppet <laughs> <laughs> I originally started in a church youth club, really. That's how we were in an amateur church youth club. But I was, at the time, I was doing some ballet training. My mother wanted me to be a ballet dancer. That was the. Uh, but that all went. I went to the Marjorie Middleton School then, but that all went wrong. Because it got to a stage, as there still is, I think, in ballet training, you get to your elementary, your advanced, get to your advanced, they gave you your first pair of tights. And that's when it all went wrong because I was, <laughs> I was a little bit nervous, a bit self-conscious, so I decided to take my tights home and try them on, you know, in the, in the privacy of my house, you know. Put my leg on the mantelpiece and the dog went for me. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> he did love the little chunky bits. Now, <laughs> now a, week, a week later, I got my confidence back and I, I put... I put, the, I put the tights on again, I walked into the rehearsal room. Somebody said, there's a funny place to hide your holiday money. And I <laughs> never went back. I, ne I never went back to dancing. I got, I got a job instead playing the piano in a pub. You know, I went to, because I played the piano. At this funny old pub. The publican gave me 30 bob to sit at the piano for a couple of hours. Customers gave me two quid to sit somewhere else. And, <laughs> I said, uh, playing the piano, as one does, you see, and suddenly, in the middle of my piano, this fellow jumped up and he shouted, that piano playing, he said, is diabolical, he said. I've got a cat at home that plays better than that. Well, it all went quiet. Not as quiet as this, but... <laughs> <laughs> and my old mother, my old mother, who's sitting quietly in the corner, taking the back off a fruit machine... <laughs> she... She jumped to her foot. And... <laughs> I forgot to tell you, she had a wooden leg. She said, she said, sir, are you mad? Or have you been drinking the bitter? And then this fellow the pub, and he came back with the cat, sat the cat down on the piano stool, and it started to play the piano, the cat. Now, it wasn't wonderful, you know. A little bit, little bit weak with the left paw, you know. <laughs> and couldn't quite reach the pedals, you know. <laughs> but who can? <laughs> After it finished, after it finished playing, the cat finished playing. The fellow went up to the public and said, "I'll tell you something else." He said, "The cat not only played that music, but it composed it." The public said, "That's fantastic." He said, "You ought to have it orchestrated." The cat was up off that stool and that. <laughs> so I thank you very much. I once went for a job. I once went for a job in a building site, and the foreman said to me, "Can you?" Can you make a cup of tea? He said. I said, yes. He said, can you drive a forklift truck? I said, Christ, how big's the teapot? <laughs> I, I, I mean, when I was working at this pub, I, I worked in the pub, but I did a lot of uh, odd jobs in between, you know. I was a lumberjack on a mushroom farm for a while. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> I played a few holes the other day at a strange golf course. I had my big golfing cap on. The greenkeeper rushed out and said, these bloody mushrooms are early this year. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> My dear sir, Bruce. Bruce, how lovely to see you. I'm and so with. glad you mentioned golf. Oh, you, because you. you're always <laughs> such a, a pleasure to play with. You oh, really are. <laughs> <laughs> but tell me, have you ever been, you know, because the game does exasperate us all, but have you ever got in such deep, desperate desperation that you've got your clubs and you've thrown them in the lake at Wisley. Uh, <laughs> I, know, I know you did it once because uh, I found them when I was looking for mine. <laughs> <laughs> but the game does get you nicked. It does it? drive, it does get you a bit mad, it does get you well, it's one of those games. Well, I tried not, uh, uh, the other, and it got, uh, oh dear, <laughs> <laughs> it got Anne mad the other night. Really? Oh. Dear, quarter to twelve the other night, Anne went... She shouted, quarter to twelve, she shouted, golf, 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 she said. All you ever think about is bloody golf, she said, like that. Frightened the life out of me. <laughs> <laughs> you don't expect to meet Henry in the 14th green at that time of night. <laughs> <laughs> normally, 
Normally, when I play on a Sunday, you know, I take up, like you do, Bruce, I'm sure, take up a nice tray before you go off with coffee and tea for Winnie and get to the bedroom. And uh, I know, the other day, I went up with a tray to Anne with tea and toast and bacon and egg and sausages. <laughs> and I said to Anne, said to me, that looks really lovely. I said, it is. Why don't you go downstairs and get yourself some? <laughs> <laughs> for, a, for a little joke. And uh, I, I was going to say that a little story I was reminded of the other day by Nick Faldo, a little informal bonfire I threw after my golf lesson. And <laughs> what's the matter for a bonfire, you know? Don't you ever try to burn clubs? <laughs> the woods go very well, but the irons tend to hang around for a while. <laughs> this story was about a fellow who went on a luxury cruise for his holidays and he fell overboard. <laughs> now, he's in this. He said, no, by the way, the other day somebody said, I thought you were going to tell the one about the girl who stowed away on the vessel and was discovered four days later, marched into the captain's cabin. And the captain said, I understand you've been stowing away on this vessel for five or six days. Well, how come? She said, well, I'll tell you what happened. I got on the boat the first day. Second day, I bumped into your second officer and he's been allowing me to use his cabin facilities, his showers, and bringing me meals three times a day and being generally very sweet. And the captain said, anything else? She said, I have to be honest, he has been taking advantage of me. And uh, the captain said, taking advantage of it. He said, I'll say, has this is the Isle of Wight Ferry. But it, is, <laughs> but it, is, it isn't that one, but this, this story, this story, this story features this chap on this luxury cruiser, and he's on a deck practising leapfrog for the sports competition. And he makes a giant leap over a widow from Huddersfield. <laughs> he goes, straight over the edge, into the water. The moment he hits the water, he thinks, I'm drowning, I'm drowning. Well, you would do, wouldn't you? And his whole life flashes in front of him. And it's not till he gets his affair with Kim Bashinger, <laughs> he realises he's watching the wrong life. <laughs> <laughs> so there he is, swimming about on his own. Swimming about on his own, and... Uh, well, you would be, wouldn't you? You would bump into a lot of people. Have you ever... How can you to drop in, you know? Drink up, there's plenty here, so so. so there he is. And he's swimming about and he uh, and, 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 and he's and he's thinking of his friends back home, his house in the Cotswolds, his friends at the polo club, his sons William and Harry, his but <laughs> he's thinking of the wrong damn life again. And in the distance he sees this desert island, palm trees waving, it's miles away, and he decides, he decides to swim for it. It's miles. Swims and he swims and he swims and eventually reaches it. He falls fast asleep on the beach. And when he wakens up, there is this huge man, king of the cannibal islands, you know, looking down at him. You know. And for a nightmare moment, he sees himself in the missionary position, <laughs> up here in boiling water. <laughs> and he looks up to him and says, I'm terribly sorry. He says, I didn't realise this was private property. And the native chief said to him, don't worry, old boy, there's absolutely no <laughs> problem at all. He said, can we entertain you in some way. Would you like a little fresh gin with some fresh <laughs> limes or a little curried <laughs> octopus in coconut milk or, or perhaps one of our lovely maidens can... <laughs> can, can he, said, he said, wait a minute, he said, I'm terrible. He said, I, 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 all very lovely, all very welcome, all these invitations, but what really puzzles me is where did you learn to speak such beautiful English? And the native chief said to him, well, so I'm going to be... <laughs> A absolutely frank, I picked it up off the shortwave radio, he said. <laughs> We've got there's a little song that kind of fits in here and just finish it. Now, since my girlfriend Sal met Miss Elsie Wolf, leading decorator of the nation, it's Phil Beckel's mind simply full of ideas on interior decoration. For instance, she assumes that the colours of our rooms are the most important factors in our lives. And if a lot of bedrooms were pink instead of red rooms, there might be many more contented wives. And so she's put all colour from her sight, and everything she owns is black and white. She's got a black and white coat, a black and white hat, a black and white doggy, and a black and white cat. She's
She's gone so far that she started to look Through the daily advertisements of a black and white cook She's got a black and white shack and a new Cadillac With a black and white design Oh, she thinks black and white, she even drinks black and white A black and white baby of mine She got in a fight with a black and white guy She gave him black and white teeth and a black and white eye So they rushed her off just as quick as a wink In the black and white Mariah to a black and white clink She said, why, sorry, my loves And with her black and white gloves Made a most disgusting sign <laughs> Oh, our family weep Cause she's the black and white sheep A black and white baby of mine She got a black and white, black and white hair with a black and white design. Oh, she thinks black and white, she even drinks black and white. A black and white baby of mine. Oh, yeah, that black and white baby of mine. And that's that. Very nice to see you, Laurie, sitting there, not behind the screen. Lovely. We, going to, we were... I can tell, can't I? Tell the story. We were going to have a fiddle player, because we're going to do a sort of uh, kind of Parisian bit later on. But uh, Laurie auditioned two fellas, and... It, I mean, the first chap arrived very, very smart, you know, with digital cufflinks and Bristol, <laughs> Bristol cream on his hair and imitation <laughs> crocodile case, and he opened it up, brought out this beautiful violin, and he started to play it. Absolutely diabolical, it was. <laughs> the second fellow arrived, well, Lord, I mean, dear me, an old dirty old raincoat tied at the waist with string, holes in his shoes, five day growth of beard, greasy old felt hat, under his arm, this dirty old newspaper parcel tied in rotten old string. And he undid it, he brought out this battered old violin, didn't he? Lord? And he started to play it. He was a bloody sight worse than the other fellow. <laughs> <laughs> Never seen your face because, because I did. I know a little bit about it because I uh, played the violin. Could I have my violin, please? Because it because I've played a, a bit. Of a tweet. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't think the first part went that badly, did it? <laughs> Good job I didn't ask for another piano. Now, <laughs> now you see why good violins are so scarce. I, uh, I'll show you this because you'll be interested. Well, you may not be, but if I, if I say you're interested, you might be. I, um, this is quite interesting because <laughs> I... <laughs> whether you whip it or play it. I, uh, <laughs> this violin. Now, this violin was given to me by my grandfather. Gladys Corbett, and uh, <laughs> had a nasty accent in the sawmill. And I shall never, I shall never forget, I shall never forget the day he gave, he gave it to me, I remember, and I thought how little he knew about music, because he, he said, uh, he looked up to me, he said, Ron, he said, Ron, he said, I'd like to <laughs> He's one of the few people who had ever been up a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> He was a sleeping car attendant on Hornby train set. He said, <laughs> Ron, he said, set, look what I've got for you, he said, a piano. So for years I didn't realise I couldn't play the violin. I thought I couldn't play the piano. <laughs> I took a correspondence course in this. I paid for a hundred lessons, but only ever received the first two. And I'm not accusing anybody. It's a bit of a coincidence that our postman is now working under the name of Nigel Kennedy. <laughs> You listen, the next time you hear Nigel Kennedy play, he's very, very good at all the advanced stuff, but when it comes to... <laughs> hopeless. He's hopeless. Because <laughs> that was the first two lessons, you see. <laughs> but never cheat for me. And I... Uh, then I had to give up the violin, I'll be truthful, because I was getting... I was getting terrible ringing in my ears. You know, terrible. Uh, and let's face it, this, you know, is bad enough. And if you've got ringing in the ears at the same time, well, it's bloody awful. Ring, 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 it used to go. So I went to see our local doctor, and uh, he wasn't much good, actually. 
He said, have you got a sore throat and, and a nosebleed? I said, no. He said, that's a pity, because I've got something for that. Uh, <laughs> This ringing went on right through until yesterday, curious enough, and I went into this shop to buy a shirt for the show tonight. The shirt. And the one I wore in the first... And, and we're coming to the exciting bit here. <laughs> <laughs> Not before time, you say. Anyway, no, we're coming to the exciting bit. I went over to the shirt counter and I said, excuse me, um... Oh, sorry, no, I didn't, I didn't... <laughs> I didn't have the violin, sorry. <laughs> Well, it's funny going into a shirt shop and going like that with a violin. <laughs> I said, excuse me, that's it. <laughs> Sounds like makes sense. Excuse me, I said... I... <laughs> Since you try going to the shop tomorrow, I said, excuse me. No, excuse me, I said. I said, I'd like to buy uh, a couple of shirts, if you don't mind. He said, yes, sir. He said, is it a, a 15 neck? I said, no, um, uh, 14. Uh, he said, no, sir, I think you'll find it's a 15 neck. I said, I'm sorry, 14, it has always been a 14. He said, do you, do you get ringing in your ears? <laughs> I said, yes, you want a 15 next. So there you are. <laughs> so I, uh, I put this back in there. <laughs> <laughs> I like to walk up and down a bit like that, you know, just stretch my legs. And uh, <laughs> left it a bit late, I know, but anyway... <laughs> Ronald, yes. you, you and I were in a film together in 1959. Yes. Rockets Galore, do you remember this? That's right. Yes, we made it on the Isle of Barra. Yes. And more recently, you've been in a film called Fierce Creatures. Yes, I have, that's right. What have you I... been doing between? <laughs> <laughs> Not enough, really. <laughs> I, um, I did uh, No Sex, Please, We're British, and, of course, we toured the play, didn't we, and yeah. we had that lovely time. But the film that people don't really remember a lot about... Um, I got into this, it was most odd. I, I was in the Stork Club years ago in, in Swallow Street when Al Burnett, who ran it, used to have auditions on Sunday night, and I'd done a bit of a show there, and I met Terry Thomas, who was a huge, big star. Uh, he, afterwards, he said, come and have a drink, and he said how he'd enjoyed it, you know, how funny it was and all that sort of thing. And <laughs> a couple of weeks later, it's true, I was driving down Tottenham Court Road in the days you could drive down it, so that's how, how long ago it was. It wasn't one way then. I was overtaken by a cab, Madly waving figure in this cab was Terry Thomas. Saying, saying, pull over, pull over, you know, slow down, pull over. So I did. And Terry got out of his taxi and he said, he said, he said, it's amazing, just seeing you like this is just the most amazing coincidence. He said, I'm about to make a film, he said, uh, to be directed by a friend of mine, Bob Day. And uh, I thought, I've just seen you, and it's just sparked off an idea, you know. And you are so right for the part. I mean, right up your street. So get in touch, here's his number, and give him a tinkle tomorrow. Uh, old, old sport, I think he said, is at the end of that. And, <laughs> and off he went in his taxi. He said, well, the next day I was round at Bob Day's office. I'm ushered into this plush producer's office. And there is Bob Day. And he is charm itself. And he says he's heard all about it from Terry. And uh, now he's met me. He's sure, Terry's absolutely right. And there's this part and this... Anyway, hey, and this film is a romantic comedy. It's set in Gibraltar. The rock itself, with all its traditions. And filming in March and you'll like it. He said, you'll love the costume. It's, you know, it might be a little bit tight and a bit hot, but, um, you know. So how would you, how would you, how would you like to play the part of one of the Barbary apes? And, um, <laughs> he, he, said, he said, the head will come off and you can speak now and again, you know. And the joke is, of course, I did it. And um, <laughs> only I can tell which one is me. I'm the one who's just a little bit more fastidious about where he puts his nuts. And that's, <laughs> that's how I know it. But that is the luck of the draw, the luck of the business, isn't it? You'd have to take the rough with the smooth, these funny rolls. Everything seems to happen to me. I make a date for golf, and you can bet it's going to rain. I try to give a party, and the neighbours all complain. I travel Euro Tunnel, and they satellite the train. <laughs> Everything happens to me. Each time I have roast turkey, I'm the one who gets the neck. I do a gig, they pay me with a bonny bouncing check. And then there's my investments, Bearings Bank and Polypec. <laughs> Everything happens to me. <laughs> I once appeared in Star Trek back in 64. I hoped that in the role I'd make it big. 
I stepped on William Shatner's line and how he swore. I wish I hadn't said, don't flip your wig. <laughs> I go out for a stroll and birdies decorate my hat. I go away on holiday and burglars strip my flat. I guess it's all my fault for walking under that black cat. Everything happens to me. My love life has been utterly regrettable, but nonetheless, I've always persevered. My one blind date was truly unforgettable, for on that night, Anne Widdicombe appeared. And my dreams are always ending with a whimper, not a bang. On last election day, I bet a grand on Ian Lang. In 1965, I did a musical called Twang. Everything <laughs> happens to me. Oh dear, funnily enough, I, uh, thank you. I... So, Ron, it's lovely to see you. And nice you to see you, my dear thank sir. Thank you very much. It's going very well. It's oh, going very you. well. <laughs> I was going to ask you, yes. who was the nicest person you ever worked with? <laughs> I think probably Basil Brush. Shall we go? <laughs> uh, no, no, that wasn't really the question. No, no, no. Anything for a cheap that laugh. Really no, that was... <laughs> You mentioned twang. Yes. Now, am I right in saying that you worked in another musical in the West End before we even met? Yes, that's right. That's absolutely right. Yes, I got, I got a job in another one that was going to take place at Drury. Drury. I borrowed some money. I borrowed £4,000 to buy a house, which you could do in those days. And I went to see the bank manager in Camden Town, still with Camden Town. And I said, uh, I'm going to do this musical uh, at Drury Lane and everything works at Drury Lane. All lasts with My Fair Lady, been on God knows how many years and playing in fancy before that. And can you lend me this money because I'm in the show at Drury Lane? And he did, and the show I did lasted nine weeks. So, <laughs> <laughs> but it was nevertheless fun and it wasn't all that disaster. But it was Bob Monkhouse and Dennis Quilly played the Antipolis and I played one of the Dromeos. And it was a job finding somebody of similar. Um, stature, uh, if I might, bold enough to use that word, to, uh, as me. And they did eventually find Sonny Farrer, darling Sonny Farrer, who was about the same build, but not quite my contemporary, but he was really lovely and he was a, a variety act. And I always remember that in the second week of the run, we did a gala performance at the Royal Opera House Covent Garden, one of these wonderful, expensive matinees with a very posh, shiny programme with the tassels top and bottom. And you opened up the page, and there on the first page was item six, the pas de deux from Raymonda, danced by Margot Fontaine and Rudolf Nureyev. And item eight, you know, an extract from The Marriage of Figaro, sung by Mirella Freni and Tito Gobi. And in between uh, these two grand items, item seven was Sonny Farrer, five foot of fun with a banjo. <laughs> I always remember dear Sonny with his banjo and indeed the show, because the show, Richard Rogers, although he was struggling and everything like that for all that time, Richard Rogers was backstage with us every night and that itself was a great honour. There were some great numbers in Boys from Syracuse, it was loaded, uh, but... Um, Falling in love with love is falling for make-believe. Oh, and what about, um, this can't be love, because I feel so well, no sobs, but my favourite, I think. Hawks and crows do lots of things. But the canary only sings. She's a courtesan on wings. So and stalks are twice as strong. Oh, the canary knows his song. But the canary gets along. Give them birth. Sing for your supper and you'll get breakfast. Songbirds always eat if their song is sweet to hear. Sing for your luncheon and you'll get dinner. And you get break the songbirds on a dawn. 
and you get breakfast, songbirds always eat. If the song is sweet to hear, <laughs> sing for your lunch and you get dinner, dine with wine of choice. If romance is in your voice, I heard from a wise canary trilling. Songbirds are not dumb. They don't buy a crumb or bread. It's said, so sing and you'll be there. Sing for your supper and you'll get breakfast. Songbirds always eat. If the song is sweet to me, sing for your lunch and you'll get dinner. Dine with wine and chore. If romance is in your voice. And you'll get breakfast, some bites are not done. They don't have to buy a crumb of bread, a spoon of bread, just make it bread. You don't have to buy even a crumb of bread, this is it. You'll be fed if you sing. Lovely and cool. I'd like to um, I'd like to thank, by the way, London Weekend for the splendid expense they've gone to in uh, <laughs> you know, this wonderful set for you know, all this, you know, everything young. All comes flat packed. Um, <laughs> very, very nice. This, this is actually uh, this is actually my own piano. I've travelled it everywhere with me for good luck. And <laughs> found it in the cornflake packet. And um, <laughs> I, where is Linda? Because Lin Linda, hello, I how are you? Very well, thank yes, you. Yes, darling. Very um, nice to see you. I've got a little question. Yes. It's, it's a bit impertinent of me, Ronnie, but <laughs> you've been talking about the piano, and I've seen you several times sitting at pianos. <laughs> Do you actually play the piano? Well... <laughs> <laughs> well, when I'm allowed to, I do actually play, you know. I mean, um, curious enough you should ask this question, because here I have a certificate from the Royal Vienna State Academy of Piano Forty Arts. Yes. Phone slow, eight, nine, nine, two, <laughs> three, six. No, I, no this, this piano actually is, this piano is a very, very uh, old piano, you know. I can remember Christmas evenings in the, at home, the old days in Edinburgh, the whole family would stand round the piano, like this. <laughs> <laughs> Wishing that one of us could play it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> then my father would give us a tune on the comb and paper. He's wonderful on the comb and paper, my dad. On a good night, you couldn't see across the room for dandruff. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> oh, yeah. He was very, very... He was, he was very, very fond of Tchaikovsky, my dad. And Tchaikovsky got married, and that was the end of it. We <laughs> <laughs> seem to see each other again, so that was it. But I always hope to play, you know, if I do well, that somebody will give me permission to actually play Ronnie. on the stage. Ronnie. Magnus. Uh, sir. Never, mind, never mind the piano. I've always been wanting to ask you, because I seem to remember you used to do a, a turn with a chair. Yes, yes, I seem to remember that. A bit yeah. like, <laughs> a bit like yeah. me. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I, was, I was given my chair at the end of my series. What happened to your chair? Pass. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't, I don't know what happened to it. Some uh, miniature replicas of mine are available in Ronnie Barker's shop in um, Chipping North. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> By the way, this phone here... You, you might be wondering about this. This phone here is a very unusual... It, that it, it's, it's so that Paul Lewis... Uh, you know, the producer I was telling you about, can get in touch with me at any time. Rather than stop the show, it's all going to... Oh, there we are, is he? I... Yes. <laughs> Hello? Yes, well, I am getting on with it. What? <laughs> it's all going very well. What? What do you mean? Oh, yes. 
I can't speak for long. I've got some people here. Now, be <laughs> yes. Yes, oh, yes, I'll get it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, he's very sweet, he actually is very sweet, because yesterday we were in here rehearsing and he said, pop upstairs to the bar, you know, the club up there, and I have a drink, and I, <clears throat> I want up there, and there he was, standing, chatting to the hat stand, and um, <laughs> he doesn't see very well. And um, neither do I, I bought them both a drink, but it was... Uh, <laughs> but, but he, he has very sweetly left me the cigar and the thing, just to make me feel, you know, that I'm uh, welcome here, which is very nice. And... Um, one of the one of the nice things um, that happens with <laughs> hello yeah oh yeah sorry uh, one of the nice things that uh, <laughs> one of the one of the <laughs> hello mm hmm Absolutely right. Yes, should have, should have thought. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Paul. <laughs> I'm very sorry. <laughs> did, did Nigel see it? <laughs> yes, right. Okay. Say <laughs> a present for Freddie Star. <laughs> I. I uh, it, but, it's, but I'm good. I'm, however, I am going to have a glass of wine. That is certainly um, something I will. <laughs> now, <laughs> I <laughs> I wouldn't normally do this. I wouldn't normally drink like this. But I'm well, not where I'm working. But I've got a terrible cold and I can't get rid of it. I've had it since I was eleven. And <laughs> <laughs> I went to see the doctor with my nose and. Um, I didn't actually see him with my nose, obviously. I <laughs> saw with my eyes. But um, <laughs> I happened to have my nose with me at the time. And he said, he said, I'm going to give you a vapour rub. I said, will it clear my chest? He said, it might bloody well clear London Weekend Television. So <laughs> and anyway, he gave me some tablets. He saw me the other. He said to me, have you taken the tablets? I said, you mean the tablet? The big white one? Oh, he said, oh, my God, you've swallowed the box. <laughs> He said, will it do me any harm? I said, he said, not unless the lid comes off. But <laughs> he's very, very, he's a very, very sweet doctor. He's more than a doctor. He's holistic. He looks up. He's wonderful words about children. He said, if you can get your children, for example, to run three miles every morning and three miles every evening, by the end of the week, they could be 42 miles away. If you know anybody who's getting married, you say, be sure and have a home movie made of the ceremony. Very often, in years to come, you might feel a bit low, a bit depressed. You run that film, it's like a fairy tale. Particularly if you run it backwards, because that way you end up single. But <laughs> I, on, on, I have to say, on my way out of the, of the consulting room, uh, later on in the afternoon, I bumped into a friend from the, uh, from the golf club who came up there. He said, looking very depressed. He said, I said, you look very upset. He said, well, I'm not surprised. He said, I've just been diagnosed a kleptomaniac, he said. Hanging his head in shame, plunging his hands deep into my pockets. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what did the doctor say? Well, he said, he's going to give me some tablets, he said. And if they don't work, could I get him a CD player? Frank, where is Frank Skinner? Frank, dear sir. How Ronnie. Um, Thank you very much for coming, by the way. Oh, it's my pleasure. Well. Um, I've been watching you on telly oh, since I was about your size. <laughs> and, uh, I'd say you were a very big influence on my career. Who were the influences on your comedy career? Well, that's very, very kind of you. I say so. Thank you very much for that. I. Well, in Scotland, I used to watch a wonderful comedian called Dave Willis, who was a little kind of funny eccentric. Then when I came down to London, all the London Palladium was its heyday of vaudeville, so all the great the Hopes and the Bennies and Martin Lewis and Johnny Carson, they were all coming over then. So there, and they were the great kind of talk, um, Chevalier doing his one-man show. The, the people who seemed to talk and you spent time with them, and when you left, you felt you had met them. So I always loved seeing them, you know, it's... You start answering questions like this, of course, I feel you made me feel seriously old. I know you didn't mean to, but uh, <laughs> you do get these feelings. So you know, you do get to a certain age, and you're tender and things like that about age. Um, you know, you bend down to tie your shoelaces and think, what else can I do when I'm down there? That type of thing. <laughs> but, <laughs> I, 
I got my senior citizen's rail card two weeks ago. And the rather embarrassing thing about it is that the week before I was travelling half fair. <laughs> <laughs> One of my daughters it, it, it came home the other night with someone from another planet. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he, I mean, he obviously tried to take on human form, you know. <laughs> Failed. Uh, he, was, he was half man, half sofa. Um, <laughs> she, said, she said his name was Peter and he was training to be a doctor. Well, he didn't look bright enough to be a patient for me. Uh, <laughs> Anne and I were very calm about it. Very, very, very... We said, tell him, tell him, darling, we are earthlings, we said. <laughs> we mean him no harm, we said. <laughs> Now, take him back to where you found him and try not to get any on your shoes. <laughs> I'll put this down. I, I had a friend... <coughs> I had a friend... Uh, I've had enough of that. I had a friend who uh, got involved in a National Health... He was in a National Health Service hospital, this fellow. And he got involved in the National Health Service Improvement Scheme. Uh, he was in... This particular day, he went out of the ward to post a letter you know, in his pyjamas and his dressing gown. Went down the road to post the letter. When he came back, the hospital was closed. <laughs> they were going to close it earlier, but they were waiting for the Queen to come and open it. <laughs> so, he's in this, and he's in his outfit with the pyjamas and the uh, dressing gown and the slippers, and he's got his, you know, portable Lugazade, you know, in the plastic bag, you know, on the wheels, and he's rushing down, rushing. He said, I must get to the pub. I don't wish to miss the darts match, he said. The hemorrhoids are playing the paranoids, he said. <laughs> By the way, if you're surprised by my use of medical terms, my knowledge of them, I come from a long line of doctors, very short doctors, <laughs> mostly specialists in the kneecap area. <laughs> Except my old Uncle Arthur, old Lofty, who was a gynaecologist. Anyway, so, <laughs> so, he's rushing down the pub like this, with these things like this. Strange story, I know, but strange things do happen. Who would have thought that one day they'd have a man in space and put Jeremy Beadle on television? <laughs> so they got it the wrong way around. But anyway, so, anyway so, he's rushing in. And he gets to the pub and he's standing at the pub like this, he's waiting for him. And the public goes up, standing there. He, he said, Can I get you that? He said, Yes, I'll have a triple scotch, please. So, so, so. Got the triple scotch in his hand. He said, Strictly speaking, you know, with what I've got, I shouldn't be having this. The public said, What have you got? He said, 20p. <laughs> I had a, I had a, I knew this girl, I knew he a girlfriend of the family, who's, who had a complex about her bosom, her thing, her shape, you know, and, if, uh, and she was sent to this special, I'm not, by the way, very good at telling stories about this sort of thing, my Scottish upbringing, you know, full of, full of repression, you know, we, we used to play doctors and nurses in Linda Marchbank's garden shed, I was always the one they sent for more bandages. <laughs> Time I got back, Linda Marchbacks was up and about and fully recovered. You know. <laughs> <laughs> They're all playing hopscotch, you know. For years, I thought that sex was something you did on one leg. <laughs> every, time, every time I tried it behind the OD and I fell over. <laughs> we had this fantasy, too, that Honor Blackman would creep into my bedroom, put her hand down her blouse and bring out two cup final tickets. <laughs> I went to see the doctor about that. He was no use at all. He wanted to buy the tickets. <laughs> this lady has arrived at this doctor's in Harley Street, and he said to her, he said, yes, you're absolutely right, he said, there is a wee technique, he said, that's awfully good, uh, that we have brought over from America, and we can certainly help me. He, he wore his glasses like that, and he said, had a theory that it saved wear and tear on the lens. He said, <laughs> he said it's awfully good, this wee technique. He said, what happens is, he said, we implant a little airbag type of thing in each bosom, and the valve is actually, he said, under your arm. Awfully discreet, he said. And I think you'll find it's money well spent. And you inflate your bosom. <laughs> <laughs> so she has it done. All very successful. She's going out for a first night with a little friend. And she's getting dressed in the decorated dress. And she's in front of the mirror. It's <laughs> 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 very, very tasty, she thinks. So she goes out with her friend and the little cocktail bar down the road. Sipping the little chat pops in. 
Hello, lady. You're looking very tasty. I'll say very nice. Can I, uh, can I buy you a drink, this little lad says. She turned round and she said, do I know you? He said, no, he said, but I think we go to the same doctors. <laughs> There's people everywhere. I've had my wear and tear. But what might shock the Western world? I don't even care. It's the only way to go. It's the only dream I know. I'm contented just to be uncomplicated me. So don't dig any deeper. What you get is what you see. I'm the only man you'll find who has nothing on his mind. Three cheers, hand me a beer. Watch my dreams become real. Oh no, please don't go. I can't tell you how happy I feel. We'll be happy till we die. My lovely dreams and I relax until they take us to that stage up in the sky. And that's the only way to go. It's the only dream I know. It's the only way. It's the only way, it's the only way to go. God bless. Good night. Thank you. I've only just come. <laughs> Hello. Ah. Oh, that's very nice. Thank you very much. <laughs> very nice. That's Paul saying he's going to let me play the piano. Linda, he's going to let me play. Ah. Oh. I'm so pleased about that because, you know, I've had so many funny letters from people, the usual people, you know, my wife and her mother. And, uh, <laughs> our local victim. and uh, so I'm really pleased. It's going to be a great thrill. And he said if it works really well, I'll be able to stay on and do a couple more stories and that sort of thing. So it's very, very, very lovely. The only thing it is worrying me is I don't want to crease this suit because um, <laughs> no, I'm booked to stand on a wedding cake tomorrow. So I, don't <laughs> so I will play... Laurie, and if it all goes well, stay on and we're going to do a little bit more. I will play um, uh, Send in the Clowns, if you like. Right.